Good morning. This is May 14th, 2023. It's known as Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all mothers out there. And I realized that for some children, some kids, it's not a very um, happy day for you because you miss your mothers who have gone on. Prayers for you today as well. But happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. You wouldn't be who you were, you are today, without your mother. Amen. I wouldn't either. Our opening scripture this morning comes from Proverbs chapter 31. It's interesting because the part of Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. But Proverbs 31 verse 30 says, Charm is deceitful. And beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Sorry about that. I had some fall over over here. Let's sit back in. So, we're going to be talking about mothers today and how that women should be praised, especially those who fear the Lord. Ooh. We, every week we pray for a number of people and it's interesting that almost every person on here not everyone but almost everyone on here is a mother that we've been praying for for a long time Rita Hoffman continuing to pray for the strengthening of her of her uh, leg I thank God we took her out to um, the store the other day she went with her cane not her walker she walked around using the shopping cart. She actually crawled up in my SUV. We need a little help to make sure she didn't fall, help her with her foot. But God's, God's healing her, and I thank God for that. So we've been praying for her. Pray for Kathy Fairley, for Keith Wilson's family, for Lisa Hunsell, Aunt Darlene, and Aunt Jane both of whom have had a fall here recently and I, I told mom I said you three girls seem to follow each other one goes to the hospital by ambulance then the next one does then the next one I said you need to stop this no more monkey see monkey do so mom when she told me that both Aunt Jane and Aunt Darlene had had a fall she goes and I'm not going to fall so <laughs> she's giving a message so pray for them Aunt Jane's back home from the hospital uh, I don't know that Darlene uh, had to stay at any time. I've heard the family was coming to visit her, so she, I believe she's home. Levi and Destiny Miller, as they've gone through uh, two different deaths, one of a child and Levi's father uh, within months of each other. Pray for my mom. She had some weakness the other day. She didn't fall, but she also used wisdom where she was going to come to an event and decided not to because she'd been a little weak and i thank god for that that she used wisdom she was missed that she wasn't there but uh, it's better to be cautious we have a couple unspoken requests pray for rob and robin ballinger um, one of which is a mother the other is a brother from another mother uh, he's not a mother my brother mark Sam Crabtree, and for Simone Redbear, who's also a mother. So we're praying for people here that need healing, people that need a few other things that they've asked for, uh, prayer for. So continue to pray and, and watch over these situations. We also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There have been issues with Gaza and Hezbollah and Hamas sending mortars and rockets over into Israel and Israel uh, retaliating. There's uh, more and more saber rattling around the nation. So we're praying for that. Uh, you may have heard of situations about the um, judiciary and uh, some riots. Well, I know people that were there in Israel at the time, they said the riots were small. They were, they were uh, people trying to make uh, headlines they were angry but the problem was is that uh, 
it was our media was skewing the the truth. Uh, in '47, when the Supreme Court in Israel was established again, there were godly men in those positions. Today, most of the judges are liberal. And the thing that Netanyahu was saying is that the uh, the judiciary, their Supreme Court, doesn't have any kind of oversight. They can make rules and laws or uh, appointments and things, and no one has the ability to say who is on that, uh, who are the people making these choices. And he was asking for some kind of an oversight, some kind of a way to do a check and balance. Our government has a uh, check and balance between the judiciary and the legislative and the executive branches, in that the one can uh, counter the other. Israel does not have that. So they're, they're trying to get some uh, changes within the decided that their narrative. Heard that in the last few years. So that's kind of what was going on there. So we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, and this is part of the stuff we're praying for, is that God have his peace within the people, within the government, within the nation, within the city, and within the people wherever they are. So I've been praying for this for many years, and we're starting to see some specific things coming out, not just attacks against Israel, but uh, even in the nation. And the reason we pray for Israel is God's eye. God says that if you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, may you prosper. They prosper who love you. And so there's many ways to prosper financially, spiritually, physically in our in our bodies. So this is something that uh, interests me. And so because we love God, we pray for it. Because God's interested in it, we want what he wants. <clears throat> Pray for workers for the harvest, people that will parent and raise up those who are coming into the kingdom. Uh, pray for the spiritual state that we live in, our, uh, our metro area. We already have the victory, okay? And for those needing jobs, I've gone on some more uh, second and third interviews. I'm waiting to hear. Either the, either the jobs are exactly what I did, and they come back and say, we found something more. So, and they're trying to apply or post for the job that I used to do. And everybody that's applying is from a different uh, uh, entity and not from compliance. And they end up closing the job, or they're not wanting to pay as much, or... I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what's going on in the job market, but uh, every recruiter I talked to said it's really, really messed up right now. So if you're looking for work, be encouraged that you're not the only one that's facing multiple interviews and not getting hired or not being asked to come back or being told you're not good enough. You are good enough. Uh, it, it's, it's a messed up situation right now. You've got to get past so many things. So we're praying for those in the job market. We're praying for those that have fixed income, that God would increase the income and decrease the outgo. I won't go into much about this, but I heard of someone that here recently on a fixed income. God bless It was like getting a raise. They, the money they have coming in didn't change, but the money they had going out changed significantly. And it was like getting a huge raise uh, in their income. So we've been praying for that for a long time, and I pray the same blessing on you, because God is no respecter of persons. Amen? If you have prayer requests that you want us to share or want us to be praying about, you can send an email to prayer at fgfellowship.org. And when you send that prayer request, let me know if it's something you want added to the prayer list or not and if, if not I'll keep it quiet and we'll just pray about it ourselves but add, send your prayer requests 
and we'll add our faith to your prayers. And God says that when two or more agree is touching on one thing, it will be done. So we want to keep lifting you up in prayer. If you have any prayer requests today that hasn't been asked, hasn't been mentioned, and it's according to God's word, when we pray, we believe God will answer that. So add your prayer to these as we pray. Let us pray. Father, we name all of these names that we've listed. That you would meet the need for healing, deliverance, for all of the situations that, that are in their families and their lives. Be God in those situations. Show yourself true. For those people with fixed income, for needing jobs, for needing an increase in their income or a decrease in their outgo, we ask you to do as you did for this one. Lord, you're no respecter of persons. We ask for a miracle in each of these lives that people would say, I can't believe this just happened. I can't believe that I have this increase now. I can't believe I have this much more money. Father, meet the need in their lives according to your word. You cannot lie. And we give you the glory, Father. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, all of these things that are going on there, we pray for sanity and peace in their country and in their nation and their governments and the people, wherever they are, that there's peace, there's safety, no matter if they're in Israel or not. Watch over them and keep them safe and give them peace. We pray for workers for the harvest, Father, to minister to new believers and teach them and lead them and guide them so that the church becomes strong and, and understand the word of God and able to stand as overcomers and con more than conquerors. We bind, according to Matthew 16, the spirit of wickedness in this city, in this county, in this state, in this federal region, in our nation, and in our nation's government. We bind the spirit of wickedness from affecting jobs and incomes and home lives and interactions of individuals that the spirit of wickedness would be broken and bound according to your word what it was bound on earth should be bound from heaven and father we loose pre peace and prosperity father sozo which it means grace for salvation grace for healing grace for wholeness and prosperity and we just give you the glory and the honor and praise that those will be released within our city in our counties in our state in our federal region in our nation in our nation's government that the name of jesus and and the honor of god would permeate our nation again that people would stand and sing the blessings of god again in our nation we thank you father and these other requests that people have on their hearts, we lift those up to you. If they're according to your word, I add my faith to them as a second voice in, in agreement, Father. That whatever their need is, whether it's a car or a home or, or an illness, whatever it's loved one, they need to be saved, healed, touched, delivered, found, wherever the situation is, that you would meet that need according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our offering scripture today comes from 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I know we've all been in church and heard sermons about uh, tithe and God keeps great records. He does. He honors those who pay their tithe. Tithe means 10%. But we also feel like God keeps attendance, that he's standing up there with a baseball bat. You didn't pay enough. I saw you only put a dollar in. Uh, I'm sorry, but I know you made more than that, so bing, hit you on the head. Or you're asleep in bed, you didn't make it to church, you missed three Sundays in the year, bing, hit you on the head. If we want to serve a God that didn't have grace, none of us would serve him. We all serve a God of grace. None of us are perfect. 
I don't have nail prints in my hands. Jesus did. He was perfect. But what he does is he makes us better. According to the scripture, God wants our heart. Now, the way that we honor him is with our tithe and with our offerings. If you go back into the Jewish history, they gave 10% of their increase. So if they planted a field with a thousand bushels of, of uh, seed and they got 10,000 bushels back, they kept back a thousand bushels of seed for the next year. So they had an increase of 9,000 bushels. That's a, just a, a, a number system here to give you something. They would pay tithe on the increase. Not on everything, but on the increase. And then they had offerings. They had other things that they would do, other uh, offerings they would give throughout the year for various things that had nothing to do with what came in for their increase. And then they would have alms. Alms were the things that they did in secret that no one knew the, the uh, gift where they gave to someone in need without anybody knowing it. There was actually a room in the temple that it had one door and only one person was allowed to go in at a time. And a person would go in and there was a box inside the room. That was all that was there. It was called a treasure. You walked in and you'd reach into your robe and you would either put in to the box whatever gift you wanted to give or if you were poor you would take out from the box and put into your robe and then the door would you go out the door you know, open the door and go out nobody could see in nobody knew what was going on inside there who was giving and who needed to take so as you're walking down through the, the marketplace you may walk right past the person who'd given a large amount of money in there secretly and you had come along and taken just enough for your family but it had it in your pocket you're standing beside them buying fruits and vegetables and stuff for your family and they didn't take out when they went in there they were the one that put it in and you don't know them and they don't know you but you're both able to partake of the fruits of the uh, of the market god knows who gave God knows who took what they needed. And God blessed both together. And so that's what this is talking about in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each one give as he proposes in his heart. What do you have to give? What do you want to give? What, what do you feel like you have to offer somebody else? But it doesn't have to be, here, I'm giving you this. It can be secret. Now, there's times you give things like that, that, you know, I have this and I want to bless you with it. There's other times it just becomes in secret. Nobody knows where it came from. And it's when the heart is involved in our giving, it's worship. And God understands that. Just like when our heart's involved when we come and ask Jesus Christ to forgive us our sins, God knows that person versus the one who says, oh, I'm going to say the prayer because I don't want to go to hell. I don't believe it, but I'm going to say it. But he knows the difference between the two. So our giving is an act of worship, and this is a good indication of that. So let's pray, pray over the gifts that have come in this week and those that will come in this week. That God bless the gift and bless the giver. Father, I thank you for each one that's given, each one that has provided, each one that has listened to you and given according to their increase or given according to their benevolence. Lord, I pray a blessing on each one of them and on the gift that it continue to be used for the things that you desire for them to be used in this body. I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week we lift up the Word of God and we make our confession. I confess and I declare that this is the Word of God. God cannot lie. His Word is truth. We accept it. We believe it. We receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of Christ's substitute work on the cross. Amen. Amen. Well, the title of today's message is Mothers. We don't have to add anything to that. We don't have to take anything away from that. Mothers 
is a is an all-encompassing word that means a lot. Now, some of us have got very great mothers, and other people have said their mothers weren't worth anything. They 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 weren't good mothers. Motherhood doesn't define from how a person's actions were, how they were uh, as you were being raised, how much they knew or what they did. That's not a mother. That's motherhood. That's uh, acting as a mother or, or, or mothering someone or nurturing someone. It all depends on how much someone does those activities. But being a mother is as simple as the person got pregnant, the person carried that child, and birthed that child. Are they a mother before they birthed the child? They're definitely a mother-to-be. They're definitely closer to their child than anybody else at that time. They're the only one that gets to hold them, the only one that gets to nurse them, the only one that gets to to take care of their bodily functions and needs before they're born. It's an interesting time, the way God designed it. But I want to talk to you about, specifically, how Christ handled honoring mothers. John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, says, Now there stood at the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took, him, took her to his home. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your anointing on me to share this message the way you provided it to me. I pray that lives be changed, that hearts be open, eyes are open, ears are open, to see, hear, and understand what your word is saying and what you want to say for the edification of the church. I pray that people take this message and mix it with their faith and it becomes profitable for them. In Jesus' name, amen. I first want to mention the people who were at the cross that are named. There were others there. The Roman soldiers were there, and there were... Uh, who knows who else, but in John's gospel, we see that John was there. He's the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the way he uh, termed himself. We say that Jesus' mother was there, and his mother's sister, Mary. So Mary, Jesus' mother, and Mary, Mary's sister, and then Mary Magdalene, who Jesus had delivered uh, seven demons out of. At least these three Marys were at the cross. Other Gospels talk about others that were there and kind of name them. And it gets a little confusing as to who's being talked about because each one of them named them just a little bit differently. So I'm going with John's Gospel here that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the sister of Jesus' mother, it says that uh, Clopas, in church history, Clopas was Joseph's, Jesus' uh, father here on earth. I would call him a uh, stepfather because Jesus is actually the son of Almighty God. That Clopas was the brother of Joseph. That would make this Mary Jesus' aunt. We all know that sisters stick together with the kids, aunts. And then there was Mary Magdalene. And so we had family at the cross. There are other church history documents talking about the children of Mary of Clopas, or Mary, the wife of Clopas. So she was a mother as well as Mary Magdalene. I mean, a Mary, mother of Jesus. And we don't know if Mary Magdalene was a, a mother or not. We know that she was uh, delivered of seven demons. And we hear from church history that she was a, uh, also a very loose woman, a prostitute, before she got uh, saved, before she got delivered. So we don't know. She may have been a mother as well. 
But we do know that there were at least two mothers at the foot of the cross. Now we need to know, understand why Jesus would take the time to pull himself up on his hands, which was excruciating pain, pushing up on his feet to get the air to say, woman, behold your son, and then to John, behold your mother. It took as much energy to say that as when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You need to know a little bit about the uh, history of uh, that time and what happened when a person was convicted. Uh, there was an article in bbc.co.uk that I looked up to get some of this information. This is for very serious crimes, this was in the Romans, uh, under the Romans, for very serious crimes, you could be killed by crucifixion, thrown from a cliff into a river, or even buried alive. And crucifixion was saved for serious crimes such as revolts against the empire. And so when the Romans crucified Jesus, it was for the most heinous type of crime. Going down into uh, Bible Interp at Arizona EDU, they were studying out a lot of the, um, uh, the, the uh, items about Roman times and some of the law. And under Roman law, there's a thing called proscription from the Latin proscriptio. Its current usage is a decree of condemnation to death or banishment. It can be used in the political context to refer to state-approved murder or banishment. The term associated and originated in ancient Rome where it included public identification and official condemnation of declared enemies of the state and often involved confiscation of property. I want to talk to you here in a little bit about why Jesus needed to assign John to his mother. And that is that the notion of widows needed someone to take care of them rests on the ideas about legal and social status of women. The most important is the idea that widows could not possess her own property. A wife was dependent on her husband, and when he died, she went to live with her father's household if he was still alive or to an adult son if she had one. Having a father or a son was fortunate because otherwise widows were entirely without resources. Widows were also legally subordinate to these male relatives. And so when Jesus died, we already know that we're not hearing about Joseph anymore. So Joseph, she was probably already a widow. Joseph had already died. And now her oldest son, who was charged with taking care of her for the rest of his life, was dying before her. And Jesus knew that to leave his mother in that state, she would be destitute. She's going to be without resources. And Jesus honored her by providing John as her protector. He made sure she was provided for the remainder of her life. If you go through and look at all the disciples and how they died and were martyred, every one of them were martyred except for John. Now, they attempted to martyr John twice. Once by boiling him in oil, he didn't boil, and they took him out. So they sent him to the Isle of Patmos, which was a prison island, and the only way you left that island was by dying and being buried there. He's, John outlived the the emperor and when the emperor died he was set free he came back to his home in Ephesus he was the bishop of Ephesus and he died an old man in his sleep in his own bed Jesus gave care and custody of his mother to the only one that was going to outlive her all the others died early enough in life he provided for her for the rest of her life in John. Mary would have been destitute without legal recourse. She couldn't have gone to the court. She couldn't have gotten welfare that didn't exist. She would have been like in the uh, 
Ruth and Naomi, if you read the book of Ruth, where she was out without her husband, Naomi was out her, without her husband, and her two sons had died, and she had her, her daughter-in-law, <coughs> Ruth. Ruth went and gleaned the edges of the field after they'd come through and harvested whatever was left that fell on the ground or hadn't been uh, taken care of in the corners. She would gather that up so they had some kind of food. Mary also would have been homeless. You see, after Joseph died, I'm sure Jesus had a home. He had to have a house to live in before he went in the ministry. He may have even come back to his house many times. His mom lived in that house. That was her home. And when Jesus was condemned to death, everything that Jesus had was confiscated. So she would have been kicked out of that home. The word only tells us in John that she went to live with John from that very hour. So Jesus took care of his mother and honored her that she would not be destitute, that she'd be taken care of. We don't see this in scripture until you dig in and see some of the nuances, because that phrase just goes along and says that he, okay, mother, this is your son, son, this is your mother, and you go on to the rest of the crucifixion, and you don't see the nugget there that Jesus was taking care of his mother. He loved his mother, he honored her. And on this Mother's Day, I wanted to help bring that out. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. At the cross, the Son of God honored her and gave her favor. At the blessed event of finding out that she was going to be carrying the Son of God as a baby, she was honored by God. Mary had the blessing of feeling our Savior growing in her belly, feeling Him move, feeling Him kick, being able to feed Him in her, inside her body to nurture him, to protect him, and to grow. God's Word describes mothers in a number of ways. I, I wanted to go through some of these just so that we get an idea of what, God, what God's Word says about mothers. Ezekiel 19, verses 10 and 11 says, Your mother was like a vine in your bloodline. Think about the umbilical cord. Giving a your mother was like a vine in your bloodline, planted by the waters, fruitful and full of branches because of many waters. She had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above the thick branches and was seen in her height amid the dense foliage. I know this is a little poetic, but mothers are being held up here as the nurturers. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Up until Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, it had only called Eve woman. And Adam actually means man, man and woman. At this point, Adam called her Eve. She did not have children yet. He called her something she wasn't because she was going to be. She had the potential. She's going to be the mother of all living, and that's what Eve means. We have Christmas Eve, we have New Year's Eve, we have the night before, just before that day. We have All, all Hallowed Eve, so All Saints Day. It's the night before, and so Eve was called mother before. Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Pay close attention, my child, to your father's wise words. And never forget your mother's instructions, for their insight will bring you success, adorning you with grace-filled thoughts and giving you reins to guide your decisions. Why does God give us mothers and fathers? Because we are being programmed and, and taught and given what we need 
for later decisions. If you think back to how your parents, especially your mother, told you various things, and how you even parrot that now, or you make decisions accordingly, you'll see how that works. I was joking with mom the other day in Facebook because she put down different things that your mother used to say. And I said, so where did breathing a scab on your nose? When we were getting close, real close to being in trouble, she'd say, you're breathing a scab on your nose. And we knew to back off. We got those, uh, that insight and it brought us success to back off. This was not where you wanted to go. So you, you start seeing a mother as the one who poured into you certain things that stayed the rest of your life. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 says, Children, if you want to be wise, listen to your parents and do what they tell you. And the Lord will help you for the commandment. Honor your father and your mother was the first of the Ten Commandments with a promise attached. You will prosper and live a long life full full life if you honor your parents. See, when a child was rebellious in Old Testament times and the parents could do nothing with them, they were to take this child to the synagogue, to the temple, to the priest, to the rabbis, and declare, we have done all of this and have tried all this with these kids. We are beside ourselves. They won't, they won't listen. They won't follow our instruction. They're not honoring us. This community would be called together and it would be said throughout the community what had just been said by the parents. Then the parents had to pick up a rock each. And they had to throw the first rocks to stone this child and then the rest of the community would do the same. I have a feeling if my parents said, we're taking you to the pastor, and you know what's going to happen if we get there. Are you going to listen? Or are you going to let us make us throw stones at you until you're dead? I think I might have listened. I listened when I saw the belt. I should have listened before it ever got to the point of a belt. But that was rough on parents that they needed to be the one that brought the accusation and had to be the first one to throw the stones. That meant it had to push the parents pretty far. But that's why the, the, the Ten Commandment there says it's the first uh, of the commandments with a promise. You will prosper and live a long life if you honor your parents. So honoring your parents meant you were listening to what they had to say. You were following their guidance. They're there to guide you. They're not, it wasn't designed for them to stone you to death and be mean to you. That was what you pushed them to. And th thankfully, we don't have a lot of uh, scripture about kids being stoned. We do know that we have a lot of scripture about uh, parents being honored. Proverbs 31.10 Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Isaiah 66.13 as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. When you're feeling down and out, when you're having an issue, maybe you're hurting, maybe you, you've got uh, deep problems, you're, you're needing healing, you're, you're sick, and you feel the comfort of God in the situation, God's liking that to the same comfort that a mother gives a child. God honors mothers with the aspect that she is comforting the same way he does a God aspect. Isaiah 49 15. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? We'll get into more of that here in a little bit, but I've, I've seen mothers' faces when they see their child for the first time. And it changes that woman. Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So mothers and fathers, especially mothers, are supposed to take in everything that they've seen and heard 
because they're to pass it on and teach it not only to the children, but their children are supposed to live long enough to have children because it's the children and the grandchildren here. So you teach your children so they don't end up being stoned, so they are honoring you and they are living long lives. And you get to see the blessing of not only your children being successful, but your grandchildren and then your great grandchildren. And you get to pass on the wisdom, you get to pass on the love, and you get to see your children saying things that you used to say, teaching your kids the way you used to. I've heard some mothers say, my only prayer for you as you grow up is that you have kids just like you. And <laughs> many of us do. <laughs> I, I thank God for my mother. As a child, we all had chores. One of the chores that I liked to have, and it was partly because of my brothers, I didn't like dusting because we had a lot, a lot of little chotskis or little things that were on uh, the hatch or on the, the different places, the side tables and things. And you had to take and clean those off and then dust under them. I liked to dust because I didn't have to wait on my brothers. I needed to dust before one of them could run the sweeper. If I was the one to run the sweeper, I was like, Mom, we're not dusting. I can't do my job until. And sometimes it's go ahead and run the sweeper and uh, they can dust later. But I like to dust so I can get it out of the way. And even the headboard in my mom and dad's bed, it had uh, a shelf and a couple sliding doors. There, on their, on their headboard, was a cross in the King James Bible. And to be able to dust the headboard, I had to set the cross in the King James Bible off of the headboard to dust it and to make sure I can put it back in the same place that it had been. Because my mom would read it every night and she would pray for all of her kids. And as, we, as kids started having kids, she started praying for all of her grandkids. As the grandkids started having kids, she prayed for all the great grandkids as well. And I know, deep in my heart, my mom prays for all of us. Mom used to go to sleep pretty early. Now, you know when somebody's got a birthday because she's the first one to send a uh, uh, birthday greeting. She stays up until midnight so that as soon as it becomes a birthday, she sends a birthday greeting out on Facebook. She doesn't say it, but I wonder if the reason she's up until midnight and 11 o'clock so late is because the family's so big she's praying for so many people. God loves a praying mother. Today's children disobey mothers and fathers a lot. We see it. We, we see it in the news. We see it in uh, things that are happening. But God knows the bond a mother and a child have. He knows how special that is. And God honors mothers. Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Just a simple little verse. It says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What had just occurred in that chapter is that the angels had lit up the sky and sang glory to God in the highest. Mary just gave birth to a son and all of a sudden it was she was serenaded by an angel choir. And then shepherds came and knelt down and honored her baby. Many people Many women, they, they glow when people come and ooh and ah over the newborn. This was different. Mary saw people worshiping her son. See, those shepherds weren't just any shepherds. They were actually Levitical priests that took care of the lambs that would be used for temple sacrifice. That's the area that Mary and Joseph were in when they found a place and laid him in a manger, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. The same thing that these shepherds would do for a newborn lamb that was going to be used for sacrifice. They would swaddle this, this new lamb in, in cloths and put them in the manger so it couldn't move around. 
you've seen new uh, animals. They, they get up and they're toddling around and they're, 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 they fall. These lambs could not have a spot or a blemish. They could not get a bruise from falling into something or they could not be used in the sacrifice. They took great care in how they took care of this newborn lamb. Mary wrapped her son in swaddling clothes and laid him in the same manger that they would use. They came and honored him and worshiped him as the Lamb of God. And Mary pondered these things in her heart. Mothers, how many times do you sit back and you think about the childbirth? Maybe you don't think about the three o'clock feedings or the getting up in the uh, night or the time that they, they messed on you or threw up on you or some kind of thing that they, they left all their toys out and you stepped on those Legos. or the, Maybe you don't ponder those, but you ponder the other things of who is this child going to be? What will they be like? I hold them in my arms now, but what will they become? Mary pondered these things in her heart that the angels sang, that the shepherds came, and later that the, the wise men came and, and honored them. God gave motherhood the spiritual implication of redemption. The concept of birth in the natural is used to understand the birth in the spiritual. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, Jesus said to Nicodemus, one of the Sanhedrin, one of the the, uh, the Supreme Court of Israel. This is the discourse that he had with Nicodemus. Start with verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The very act of, of conception, nurturing a child in the womb until it's born, is the same, take, taken from the natural, the same to the spiritual about being born again. Jesus has, we have to be, accept Jesus into our heart and we put in a new creation. We start becoming something we weren't before, just like a, that embryo is growing from something that it wasn't into something that it will be. And then that, that birth process, that new birth, is likened unto a mother giving birth to a child, the spiritual implication of redemption, going from where you were a sinner to becoming a saint, and going from being unsaved to becoming saved is the act of a mother birthing a child or us being reborn born again god uses the natural to give us an idea of the spiritual many of our mothers if we have good mothers we will all call them godly mothers why the nurturing, the comfort, the, the soothing, the, the taking care of us as we grew until we could stand on our own is so like the aspects of God that we need in our lives. Honor mothers. If you still have your mother with you today, call her. Mother-in-laws, uh, daughters that are mothers, daughter-in-laws that are mothers, contact them and let them know that they're special. Because without them, none of us would be here. And without them showing the concepts of grace and nurturing, we wouldn't even understand how God is graceful and how God nurtures us. 
Mothers play a big part in the raising of us from childhood, but also into manhood. You wouldn't be who you are without a mother along the way that took the time. Amen. You may be watching this and saying, all this is good, but I don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I've never asked him into my heart. I don't know about this new birth, this, this born again that you talked about. You can ask Jesus into your heart and be born again. And it takes all the same effort that it took for you to be born the first time. You didn't do anything. You were just born. It happened and you were. Jesus did all the work. He just says, will you accept this? And if you do accept it, you become born again. I'm going to say a little prayer. If you want to ask Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior, follow me with that prayer. Believe it in your heart, not just your head. And you'll find he makes you a new creation. Let's pray. Dear God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I can't make it to you on my own. I've tried and I've messed up. I know that Jesus came and lived and died for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess Jesus as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, tell somebody, I prayed the prayer asking Jesus into my life. I prayed Jesus, to, asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Part of confession is not just hiding it in yourself, well, I'll tell somebody later, but it's actually telling someone because it's confessing Jesus. God would not have any of us here if he hadn't created motherhood. Adam and Eve, if they hadn't ever sinned and they hadn't become parents, they'd be the only two on this earth. But because they had children and their children had children and so on, we are here. Your mothers are to be honored. Honor them, not because of who they are, but because of the position God put them in your life. That you're here because of them. God bless all the mothers out there. I know that uh, there's probably many different uh, dinners and or uh, blessings that people are doing for their mothers today. Those who don't have their mothers here, I bless you today with comfort in Jesus' name. As we close today with the benediction, Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. Let God bless you by putting his name on you today. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and the Lord give you peace. Shalom. God bless. See you next week.